So thank you uh, for the invitation and the opportunity to speak before you. I would also like to thank my Croatian publisher, Fraktura, who is such, doing such tremendous work in cultural transfer. My translator, Ines Nesrovic, um, who gives me a Croatian voice, and of course the Goethe Institute, who once more was enabling this little event here as it will tonight at the Fraktura Bookstore, uh, another conference of that kind. I would like to talk to you about a part of the book uh, that's published now in Croatia, uh, especially on Simon Weil and the violence of war. Let us, on today's World Day of Philosophy, talk about war. After all, we are, you can read it every day in the newspaper and on your threads, at war again. Or at least ready for war again, for collective rearmament. Indeed, apparently forced to do so. And of course, since last March, within a few days, we have therefore all transformed together from Twitter experts on biology to experts on geopolitical and the rearmament matches. And our knowledge has expanded exponentially since then. How fast that goes. But what do I, as a child of the affluent Western European post-war period, actually know about war from my own experience? Nothing at all. I know so little that just a few months ago, we and I thought it was impossible in the heart of the continent. <coughs> and I also had suppressed as many of my fellow citizens the fact that elsewhere in Europe, such as here in Croatia, the experience of war is still quite present in your families on the one hand, but on the other hand, it is consciously suppressed and kept quiet also. So there is, I think, more than one good reason to let us enlighten ourselves a little bit about this and every other war. Aufklären, to enlighten. In German, this word has, until today, first and foremost, a military meaning. Namely, a sounding out, scouting out, and describing an area in which a battle or a fight will be fought. To this day, the Bundeswehr has more full-time officers for enlightenment, Aufklärung, than Germany's philosophical seminars have active philosophers of enlightenment. As we all know, enlightenment is not doing so well at the moment. Let us then be enlightened about this new terrain, this new zone, this new chronotope of war into which we have been drawn for months. And this by a woman who has experienced war at first hand, who went to war quite consciously and with a shouldered rifle. A philosopher who has thought about the nature, effect and drift of war as deeply and clarifying as no other thinker of the 20th century, I would claim. I'm talking, of course, about Simone Weil, in particularly about her war phenomenological writing, The Iliad and the Poem of Violence, which she put down on paper in Paris in the winter of 1939-1940, expecting the onslaught of the Wehrmacht on France, and thus created a text which one really wishes would be distributed and read in the schools and high schools, universities, factories, barracks, and ministries of this continent at the moment for the enlightenment of all our war souls. For in the face of the expected excess of violence, Dale wants to mentally assure herself of its consequences for her country and her continent. What? is the essence of war, what dynamics underlie it, and last but not least, under which conditions can it be considered as justly conducted. To this end, Weil consults what she believes to be the greatest and most merciful testimony to war in Western history, Homer's epic of the Trojan War. In the months of the winter of 1939, she wrote a meditation on the nature of warlike violence entitled The Iliad, or The Poem of Violence, which is one of the most profound philosophical documents of the period. First of all, according to Weil, 
The special feature of the war situation consists in its unbounded relationship to violence, which causes a reification of man, because, and I quote, violence turns everyone who suffers it into a thing. If it, is, if it is exercised to the last consequence, it turns man into a thing, in the literal sense. It turns him into a corpse. There was someone, and suddenly there is no one. This is the image the Iliad constantly presents to us. In truth, however, as the Iliad vividly conveys, the logic of this reification reaches much further and much more devastatingly so, as if it were a philosophical commentary of the day on the situation of the war between France and Germany, Bale's essay emphasizes the overlooked effects of the war situation in the consciousness of all of those affected. I quote, the violence that kills is a punctual, brutal force. How much richer in its methods, how much more surprising in its efforts is that other violence which does not kill, or rather, not yet. It will certainly kill, or it may kill, or it may merely hover, hover over the man it may kill at any time. But in either case, it petrifies him. From the power to make a human being into a thing, another, even more amazing power arises, that of making a human being a thing while he or she is still alive. He or she lives, has a soul, but is a thing. A strange being, such an animate thing. A strange condition for the soul. The situation of war thus creates a new state of existence across the board, which robs people alive of what constitutes and guides them as human beings in the true sense that is the openness, plasticity, liveliness of their soul in the face of the other. With a view to the Greek world of war, Veil also summarizes this strange state in which a soulful other is perceived and treated only as a thing, as a state of slavery. After all, the common consequence of a lost war was enslavement by the victors particularly of those who had, no specifically, had not specifically participated in the fighting, such as women and children. The state of enslavement resembled, I quote, Vale, a death that pervades the whole of life, a life that death freezes long before it has extinguished it. War, as a shared situation, in effect, enslaves everyone since it implies in each individual a fundamental shift regarding the relationship to the other as the declared enemy. It is precisely in war that the philosophical imperative of know thyself must therefore be fulfilled. For what necessarily goes hand in hand with the petrification of souls is the obscuring of the view for the consequences of one's own violent actions. Vail recognizes the potentially world-healing value of the Iliad in this context in the fact that its entire representational will aims to heal the people who have fallen into war from this specific blindness. I quote, as relentlessly as violence destroys, so relentlessly does it afflict the one who possesses it or thinks he possesses it. No one really possesses it. The Iliad does not divide people into the defeated slaves or fugitives on the one hand and victors and masters on the other. There is no one who does not have to submit to violence at some point. Even the soldiers, freed and armed, must endure orders and taunts. Quote, if it is destined from birth for all of us to suffer violence, this is a truth to which the power of circumstances closes man's eyes. The strong is never quite strong, the weak never quite weak, but neither one knows it. The actual goal of an enlightenment in this respect can therefore never be 
to completely eliminate violence from the world, not even warlike violence. Because an absolutely violence-free living together would succeed only if there would be no more power differences in the social relations between human beings. And this condition would be again one which could be produced and maintained, if at all, only with the highest, even downright, total social force. No, what it can and must be about is enlightenment, and the sense of such a description alone is the liberation from the blindness for the conditions and consequences of one's own actions in war, as well as for the circumstances ultimately caused by nothing but historical coincidences in which one finds oneself as a person to commit or to suffer violence. Only when one's <coughs> eyes are open to this can a measure and compassion prevail at all, which shows a way out of the spiral of death and killing because, so Weyl says, <coughs> only those who know the rule of violence and know how not to obey it can love and practice justice. I think we are all currently experiencing in our own bodies, in our own souls, <coughs> how this new state of existence of war, of which Weil speaks, is taking hold of us, or threatens to take hold of us, how the blindness of war, named by Weil, is affecting us, how this state threatens to permeate, permeate our thoughts, perceptions, and evaluations from within, how it penetrates into the smallest words and emotions, our dreams and nightmares, and how difficult it is to escape this threatening blindness, this slumber, to keep awake or, as they say today, woke, to remain attentive to those changes within, to carry out the program of enlightenment as a program of self-enlightenment. In any case, at the moment when we can only perceive and describe others as enemies, it is war. It is this what reifies us, no matter whether in the role of the perpetrator, victim, or even just hypocritical spectator and conscriber. Does it enslave our thinking until we here have become so deaf that we all too unanimously join in the chorus of warmongers and thus forget that to quote Bale, it is ultimately only words decorated with capital letters that serve as the actual reasons for war. Or indeed, Bale continues, words bloated with blood and tears of which none, if we only look at the edit more closely and examine it, has any real memorable content and thus also does not specify a real goal of action. To quote Weil, all the words of the political and social vocabulary could serve as example for this dynamic. Nation, security, capitalism, communism, fascism. As it was to be proved also within the last months again. But according to Weil, there's another form of violence-related war typical blindness. It concerns not so much the concepts, <coughs> concepts of one's own thinking and judgment, but rather that which, by its very nature, eludes these concepts, namely the absolutely random and contingent nature of warlike reality, for which every human being who wants to act and must keep himself open, and for which no human being who is at war wants to keep himself open. According to Weil, this fatal blindness to contingency that characterizes a mental state of war can be derived as follows. With the entry into the state of war, a distrust creeps in, in which every irritation, no matter how small, how accidental, may serve as a trigger for the last precisely murderous means. We have seen so two days ago. Maybe just an accident, maybe just a contingency. Precisely because no one does, because one 
sorry, precisely because one does not want to leave anything and anyone to the power of chance in a life and death situation. And therefore it unfolds the highest power in war, even rises to the actual ruler of events, contingency that is. As once with the myth mythical client seer Homer as the presumed creator of the Iliad, Simon Weil's view at the beginning of 1940 is almost prophetically sharpened when she illuminates why chance will catch up with the greatest, according to the claim, the greatest absolute leaders of war. I quote here, and I think that's a very important quote. He who has the power moves in a milieu which does not resist him without anything in the mass of people around him being capable of creating an impulse between action, the small distance in which there remains room for thinking. Where thinking has no place, there can be neither prudence nor justice. Since others do not give them the restraint that consideration for our fellow man demands, they, the great leaders, come to the conclusion that fate gave them all rights and those to destroy inferiors to them. Thus, they overestimate their powers. They must overestimate them because they do not know their limits. This delivers them irre irrevocably to chance and they are no longer masters of the situation. This punishment for the abuse of power carried out with geometric rigor was the first object of Greek thought it is the soul of the epic, the soul of the Iliad. Once seized by the fire of warlike violence, the loss of any contradiction on the part of the victorious leads to the loss of prudence, and finally to the loss of the feeling for the factual exposure of all one's own actions to chance. And the sign of the coincidence which co-conditions all things, a total leader thus paves the way to his own downfall. This course of events does not owe itself to any divine intervention, but is already in Homer owed to the nature of violence itself. More than anything else, it demands moderation. More than anything else, it tempts to excess, especially at war. The more unconditionally a warlord misunderstands himself in this abundance of power and control, the more certain he is that one day the all-consuming na nature of violence will catch up with him and overthrow him. Therefore, the actual question to be clarified for Simon Weil even before the battle can only be how and whether his, her own nation would be able to find itself disembodied in the course of the war and thus defeated in a decisive sense. Those who read the Iliad correctly understood, that is, would require nothing less than a true miracle or at least a superhuman effort to evade that fate. I quote Vale. A moderate use of force which alone could escape this real work would require a superhuman virtue as rare as a preserved dignity in the state of weakness. Moreover, even moderation is not without danger, because the prestige of which more than three-fourths of the power consists springs chiefly from the tremendous indifference of the strong to the weak, an indifference so contagious that it is transmitted even to those to whom it applies. But it is not usually political thinking that counsels intemperance. The temptation that lies in it is almost irresistible. Who would have such who would not have such a person in mind today, directly, before our own eyes, when hearing Wales' words about the powerful people who no one can stop anymore? A person who has probably had no one in the Kremlin to stop him for 22 years and who therefore, as Simon Weil says, no longer knows his limits and thus sees himself irrevocably at the mercy of the geometry of chance, according 
to Greek world belief ultimately obeys everything, ultimately limits everything and brings it to an end. That would almost be a reason for hope. Hope as an attitude is primarily turned towards an open future which, according to Simon Weil, brings us to a third phenomenological diagnosis of a man in a state of war, namely his relationship to time and death. Death as a form of temporal dissolution par excellence. In the face of death, the ability to present, to preserve moderation reveals itself as actually a superhuman determination. As if in a direct reversal of Martin Heidegger's thoughts on be in thoughts in being and time, which at the same time as they wrote this piece inspired not the least Simone de Beauvoir and Jean Paul Sartre to a new understanding of freedom and authenticity, Simone Weil sees the greatest seduction of war and its fear of death in igniting in the soul of each individual a kind of existentialism of mercilessness. That is, with the concrete prospect of one's own death, any perspective for shaping a future that extended beyond the period of war itself is also lost. While Heidegger nobilizes the anxiety written running ahead of Dasein to its passing as a condition of true self-grasping and determination, Simone Weil recognizes in it the sure path to an all-raising self-missing. This is exemplary embodied by the relationship that spreads out in the consciousness of a soldier to the phenomenon of time as future. I quote Weil. The thought of death cannot be endured. Only in the flesh, as soon as one feels its possibility. It is true that every man must die and that a soldier can grow old in the battles. But for those whose souls are forced under the yoke of war, the relationship between death and the future has changed. For the others, death is a limit set to the future. For them, the soldiers, it is the future itself the future that determines their profession. <clears throat> that people see their future in death is against nature. Consciousness is then strained in a form which it cannot long, long endure. But each new day exposes it to the same necessity and days become years. The soul suffers from violence every day. In the morning it is incapable of striving for anything because thought cannot set out with encountering death." End quote. Lines written more than 80 years ago, shortly before a new world war really broke out. A world war that Simon Weil had prophesied years before and considered inevitable at the time. But it was not destiny, just as it not need to be fate today but something that once again calls for the greatest, almost superhuman effort, I quote Bale, never to admire violence, never to hate the enemy, never to disregard the unfortunate. We have here, yes, still easy talk, and we can still talk freely. So let us talk and discuss together about the possibilities of a healing enlightenment in times of war and also about who would be most likely to provide it in our present time. I'm afraid the contemporary philosophers won't be amongst them. Thank you very much. <laughs>